Um, welcome to Reclaiming My Time, Pen Out Loud. I am so excited to be here. I'm actually, my palms are a little sweaty because I liked all of your books so much. I'm <laughs> fangirling a little bit. <laughs> um, all of these women, these esteemed authors that are with us today, have written about women's lives in really profound, complicated, delicate, devastating, and sometimes delicious ways. <laughs> and, so, um, and having kind of immersed myself in your work for the last couple of weeks, I've really been thinking about you know, what it means to be an author, a woman author, right now. Um, I don't think there's really ever been a time in history where it's not controversial to be a woman writer or to write about women. But it seems particularly acute in this moment to be a woman that's writing about women's experiences just from, by virtue of the current political regime, shall we say. So, <laughs> and partially thinking about, obviously, you know, I just uh, came back from book tour uh, about a book about resistance and revolution in Trump's America. It's something I'm thinking about a lot, but I've also been thinking a lot about the kind of reemergence re of the war on women and you know the desire to kind of you know we have someone in the white house right now that is comfortable humiliating women and attacking them and harassing them and you know endorsing people that do the same and so eventually you know i i, I do want to talk about how that's kind of impacted your writing but i want to start with and this is how i started nasty women um, about the night of the election. I, was, I had just written an essay about the historic first moment um, that we were gonna have a woman president. Um, and I filed it to my editor and I ran off to the Javits Center. And obviously that's not how history turned out. <laughs> where, were, where were you on the night of the election and, and how, how, how has it impacted your year? Um, I, I don't know, can, I, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, I was on the Upper West Side at a, a friend's gathering in an apartment. And the night was going really well, of course. Like, the, the husband of the house was from the South, so he was making, like, macaroni and cheese and all of these, like, good food. <coughs> and then I think when Trump won Ohio, that's when everything started to change. All of a sudden, there was a woman next to me who just started crying. Like, to this day, I haven't heard anyone cry like that since like my stepfather passed. It was a Jewish woman, and she was just saying uh, she doesn't know how she's gonna go home for uh, Thanksgiving anymore because Trump is one. And I, I left, I was afraid to go back home um, because the man that I was rooming with um, was a white gay Republican and a Trump supporter and believed in Pizzagate. And he lived in Harlem. So I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna go home and I don't know if he's up. I don't know if he's gonna push it in my face. Um, and so I, when I stepped outside of the, the apartment, it felt like the rapture had happened. Like it felt like just everyone just disappeared. Um, the Lyft, I, I called an Uber home. The Uber driver, um, his name was Muhammad, and he was trying to talk to me. And I was like, oh, I didn't know what to say. There was nothing to say. And I went back home. Granted, it was my roommate was asleep, but I couldn't get to sleep. Um, I prayed about it, and I was like, God, like please let me just go to sleep. I woke up an hour later, like just alert. Um, and it impacted my year because I ended up moving out of my apartment. Um, there was a woman I met at the Upper West Side um, gathering who was uh, a real estate agent. And the next day, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so the next day I was like, I can't stand this. I was like, literally my roommate's footsteps were like, pissing me off like I was like I I'm a Christian but like if I need to do some like sanary of like I need to call somebody up what do I need to do to like get him out which was not you know but I called her up and I was like I can't stay in this house anymore like can can I come over there even though I just met this woman she's like come over as long as you're not allergic to cats and then I came I went over there I stayed there for like a, a, mo a month sorry a dagger like day and a half and yeah then like a month later like I, I got my own place um because I just I couldn't stay in that apartment anymore after that and and granted like months leading up several months leading up to that point I had, my roommate would make conversations about Trump even though I did not want to talk about it. Um, he thought Hillary was a, a criminal and, you know, but that was the breaking point. I was like, I cannot stay in here anymore. It's not going to help my writing. Um, so yeah, I moved. <laughs> that's what, that's what, that was my, that was my resistance, was moving. 
I was in front of my computer, pressing refresh, <laughs> because I could not believe that it was happening. And I was really angry at the New York Times, the newspaper of record and a newspaper I love. And that has been very good to me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Because they had this little graph, this little meter that said if she's going to win or not. And I believed it. Every day I would check and I believed it. And every time people would freak out, I'd be like, she's got this. And then finally, what ended up happening was um, I voted for Hillary Clinton. And at the same time, I must confess right here, I did have the burn. I did. <laughs> Every Safe space. <laughs> Wait, what's the burn? What's that? A Bernie, Bernie Sanders. Oh, uh, <laughs> I was like the burn. B B E R N. Okay, no, okay. I did have the burn because I thought it was a really clear cut idea of a good leader in terms of in many ways. And it actually, in retrospect, in retrospect, people kept on saying he can't be president because he's not qualified. I'm going, and. <laughs> So anyway, so I did vote for Hillary Clinton because I thought that was the right thing to do, and I felt like she was a girl who did her homework, and that was important to me, and I thought she was presidential. Anyway, so after I hit refresh, my husband said to me at 10 p.m., you know she lost. And I was like, no, 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 because I thought that if I kept vigil until 2 a.m., some there'd be a mistake. Yeah. So in my faith, I sat there. It did not happen. How did it impact my year? I have to confess, I'm 49 years old. I'm older than everybody here, if not by one decade, two. Okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, over here. No, no, just, just in this little panel. No, no. You might have a year over me. But, so in this room, I'm, in this little panel here, I'm about two decades older than you are, right? If not more. And I will say, as also as a history major, I just don't get that nonplussed about things like this. I didn't feel like I had to cry until my eyes fell out. I felt really pragmatic, and I decided that I'm going to fight as hard as I can the next day. And every single event that I have done since I've been on tour, and I've been on tour for a year and a half plus now, and I've got another six months to go, I talk very specifically when asked questions about Donald Trump. What can we do? How can we not despair? How can we, how can we resist? How can we have small acts of kindness for those who feel excluded? All those things really matter. So I don't think it's that we have to have a revolution, necessarily, but the revolution can be in very small ways. Like today, I posted on Instagram, I'm learning about Instagram, everybody. The old person is learning. <laughs> And I posted that today a disturbed man tried to blow up our city. And I can be scared, but we will not stay home. And there are small ways we can resist being terrified of an evil person in Washington, D.C. who really wants to hurt us. And the other thing that I talk a lot about, and I would like to talk about it at some point today, is I think we should pay very careful attention to things like gerrymandering, the Electoral College, and the tax law. So I was at a, can you hear me? Is this on? It is, okay. I was at a writing residency during the election. I was at Yaddo for six weeks and the entire residency was having a collective nervous breakdown that just went on and on and on. And every morning at breakfast, people were yelling at each other and the tension was real. And then we went to a election party at uh, the woman who runs Yaddo, like she invited us to her house. And we just sat there and I cried. Luckily she has children, so I asked her for a stuffed animal and she gave one to me and I Aww. squeezed it. I was like, I need something soft to squeeze extremely hard. So not a live animal, but something <laughs> stuffed. Um, and, and yeah, and then of course, you know, my wife called me the next, my, my, then girlfriend now wife called me and was like, I really want you to come home. Uh, I'm freaking out here. Like I, you know, and I had a few more days at Yado and <clears throat> it was just, it was a, it was a lot. It was really a lot. Um, and I, I cannot lie. I have been really despairing this year. I feel, I, I feel buoyed by your resistance. I feel very um, crushed by the gears of the days of this year in a way that I did not think 
I could feel. Um, it's like the closest thing to a, de- I don't want to call it a depression. I, I really do. I feel like I've been very, like every time I've written about it, it just fills me with just rage and sorrow and I feel very helpless, which is like extremely scary to admit. Um, and I don't want to be, I want to be like, I want to fight, I want to resist, but I'm also like, I feel really devastated and I, I feel like I'm afraid, I'm allergic, like I'm afraid of like reading, <laughs> like, I don't know, I'm afraid of like the news because it's like, I don't even know what's going to happen next and it's like so upsetting and terrifying mm-hmm. and it really, it really scares me. So I'm like, I'm like terrified. Um, I hope I'll feel better after hearing more we have to say. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't feel good. <laughs> this year has been really weird and, and terrible. Uh, sorry. Well, on that, <laughs> thanks for sharing. <laughs> no, um, I, yeah, and I, I answer this question differently every day, like based on the day as well, but thank you actually for sharing. Um, so one of the things and one of the ways I feel like I've really internalized and thought about this last year um, has been you know, my kind of resistance has always been very cerebral. And it's always been, you know, thinking through patriarchy, thinking through oppression. And this was the first time that I started to think about my body and what it's like to live in my body in a country where I might be hated. I'm not really sure, but I'm pretty sure based on the news. Um, And one thing that really stuck out to me in all three of your books was, I think often women's writing is considered like, oh, the emotional journey of a woman, the emotional journey of a woman, right? And, um, but what kept sticking out to me was the body, the role of the body, um, ability, masculinity, femininity. Um, Min, I want to start with you on this question. Um, I think that one, you know, one of the things I noticed kind of reflecting on your book is the role of ability and um, some of your male characters having different types of disability um, and the impact that that had on them as characters. But also Sunja, the main character, how um, when she reflects on herself, she often goes back to her body. She's like, I have, you know, or or you describe her body. Um, Was that intentional? Um, and, And kind of can you talk through your process around that? Um, so Sanja, my main character, is an illiterate, poor, unconnected, unprotected minority woman in a country which is very hostile to her group. And she's there when she's an incredibly young person, essentially having being pregnant with another man's child. And I believe, and I, I get asked this a lot about feminism, is that I'm a global feminist, and I believe that right now in the world, women have it really, really, really hard. And as many advances that we have in Western, as, as, a, as a Western feminist myself, I feel very connected to the lives of women who are illiterate, who are poor, who have no protections today. There are girls today who cannot go to school without the fear of acid being thrown in their faces today. There are women who cannot drive cars today. And all those things are about ability. I think one of the reasons why all of us feel so offended by the idea of having Donald Trump as president is primarily because he violates our sense of meritocracy. We believe that people should be able to be president because they worked hard for it. All of us romantically believe that, even though historically we know that's not true. We know that's not true. We know every single day that people work really hard and don't get anywhere. But in terms of ability, I wanted very much as a writer to talk about the metaphor of physical ability as well as the um, literal physical ability because you cannot take care of yourself if you are pregnant sometimes. You cannot take care of other people if you have to take care of your child. You can't earn money if you don't have child care. And all those issues are legal, incredibly important issues that women have to think about all the time. Why? Because we have a uterus. Yeah, and it made me think a lot about the limits, the embodiment of gender and identity and kind of ethnic identity and how the body you inhabit and how that kind of impacts what you have access to. Um, so Morgan, your um, the first essay, and I'm not going to you know spoil anything because everyone is, has to buy it in January <laughs> when it comes out. <laughs> your first essay was like a gut punch for me. You are it's so brave in terms of you talking so openly, if you don't mind talking about what the essay is about uh, and you know your process in writing it. Um, but I think it gets at also issues of embodiment. Yeah, um, 
So it's interesting to talk about meritocracy because I think I'm going to like echo, piggyback off that a little bit. Um, so the first I said in my book, um, it's like two stories and it's combined. And, you know, growing up, I knew that I was different aesthetically from a lot of my friends, but I didn't know the moment I was black um, until I tried out for an all white cheerleading squad. And it's hard not to spoil it, but I guess what I'll say is that, um, I tried so hard to mimic the white girls around me, and I ended up not getting it. No, no, no girl of color um, got it. And I remember I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. We were arguing about something, and she said, "Like, you know, you know why you didn't make the cheerleading squad? Because monkeys like you don't make cheerleading squad." And that's what it made me realize. Like, I didn't know if I was trying out to just be a beautiful girl or to be a human. And then thinking about that trauma, I talk about when I was in high school. Um, and there was a viral video that came out like last, like yesterday or something of this, like this boy named Keaton who was bullied and I couldn't watch it because um, the book was the only space where I can talk about how much I was bullied um, for things that I thought was gonna save me. It wasn't enough that I had good grades or I, I came from a, a, a nice, comfortable middle class background. I thought if I dressed just like this, um, the way my mom told me to, to look the part, then I would be safe. And I was bullied by other black um, girls for that. And the only reason why I felt like I, had, like I could stay alive, so to speak, besides discovering my um, love for writing is because I knew that like statistically, systematically, I was gonna be way better off than them, which is horrible to think about, but it just plays into the fact that like even when you're a kid, your condition of how you're separated from other people, whether it's because your mom's trying to protect you to assimilate to other white people so that you'll be able to get in spaces that she never dreamt of getting into, or it's just a matter of like, I just wanna feel validated in these small spaces in the margins of like high school. So yeah, I wrote about that and it was difficult for me because um, when you're writing about horrible experience, heroin experience, it's already difficult enough, but when you're writing about how you learned how you are a black girl and it doesn't come from a place of magic, it doesn't come from a place of, you know, triumph. It comes from a lot of grotesque situations. And so I had a very great editor um, who told me that should be the first essay. And I didn't want it to be because I was afraid that a black girl would open up to that section and read some of the thoughts that I had and be like, oh my God, like she's terrible and then close it. But then again, it's like, I think as an essayist, um, or when I write essays, whether it's in this book or whether it's online, like I tell people, like I can't promise you pretty. Like I can, I can tell you that I have these nice sentences that were, you know, combed over with an editor, but I can't promise you pretty situations, especially when I'm talking about the evolution of me as being a black girl and a black woman, because if I did, then I'd be lying to you. So I have to go to those difficult spaces, which has a lot of shame embedded in them, and then bring you out. And then I hope that, you know, the people that are pulled in will stay along for that, that trajectory. I was pulled in. <laughs> um, Carmen. <laughs> I, uh, it's funny when I was thinking about this question for you, I was like, oh yeah. And uh, let me ask her. And I went back to your book and I was like, oh right, it's about the body. Like the body is your site of um, creativity and exploration. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and why you kind of decided to, um, the, the set of stories that you did kind of? Yeah, I mean, I, um, <laughs> I had this weird experience. This one of the weirdest things about the book, my book coming out this year, was that it was like weirdly relevant, like even more relevant, or it felt more relevant than before. And people were like, "How does it feel that like, you know, your book is so uh, politically on point?" And I was like, "I would give my book away to the ether if it meant Donald Trump was not president." <laughs> you know, like, like, um, but all, <laughs> uh, like I would, I would, I wish if only. But also. Um, there's this weird thing where it's like, I didn't write the book this year, like I've been writing this book for five years, right? So I'm sort of interrogating like the fat body, the queer body, the female body, and I, it's weird, yeah, so it's like, it's like it feels relevant now, but like women's lives have been garbage for all of human history, you know? <laughs> it's not like I like invented that, or that just happened this year. Um, 
So, so it's it's still relevant, right? It's 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 been, it's was, was relevant for the last five years. I've been writing it. It was relevant before I was born. It'll be probably be rel- it'll be relevant into I think the end of time. And um, sorry, I guess someone <laughs> just made a, ho- a, a sad noise. I mean, I um, so yeah. So I just feel like, uh, and I don't know. I, I don't know really why. I think when I first started really interrogating like what it was I wanted to write about, like what really interested me, it was it was the way in which like bodies shape us. Um, and I feel like there's this very um, privileged sort of white male position of like the pure intellect, the idea that like, oh, you could just be this like pure bubble of intellect and that's it. But like, no, like your mind is filtered through your body. Like it is impossible, you know, there, that is just the nature of the mind, right? So I don't know, that was just for me, that was what I wanted to write about and what I needed to write about. Um, I need to kind of get that out of my system. I mean, I'm sure I'll continue to write about it in the future, but it was like, you know, like they say your first book is always like the thing you've been thinking about and holding up in your body for like your entire life. And like, that was what I was like, oh, wow. Like it's this, like, this is what I need to like interrogate um, because this is what's shaped my entire existence. Yeah. And a lot of the essays, although, and the book is a variety of fantasy and um, realism and, um, science fiction, and but a lot of the essays, often the body ends up being this metaphor for a lesson that you learn from your surroundings, which I found to be, I was like, oh, I see what she did there <laughs> when I got to the end of an essay. Um, but while I still have you, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, based on you know a conversation that I think is happening very much in the public right now around sexual harassment and sexual assault, Um, Obviously, we are having this kind of cultural moment around the Me Too movement, as the New York Times is calling it, Um, and a moment where we're talking very openly about sexual harassment and sexual assault, but not with a ton of nuance. And I've kind of been like gone back and forth with like, maybe I'm okay with that, maybe I'm not okay with that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think all of you talk about the nuance of consent in different ways. Um, I kind of... What the reason, and I was thinking about Carmen and Min, you both have um, situations that are consensual, but like, I don't, uh, it's, <laughs> what, like, like they, they kind of, they complicate um, the narrative a little bit, um, and I imagine they were difficult to write um, in terms of just thinking about, um, and I'm thinking about your first essay and uh, you know if you could talk to that a little bit if you were thinking about that but it really brought that home for me what it brought home for me is this conversation we're having right now about how you know what consent looks like the age of consent and then how things become consensual over time <laughs> and yeah well so the first story in my book uh the husband stitch which is a retelling of the urban legend of the girl with the green ribbon around her neck um so the end of that story if you if you remember that story if who here remembers that story from their childhood okay a lot of you so you know at the end of the story her husband her husband unties the ribbon and her head falls off right um and so that's sort of the that's the magical element so that's the the horror story um and in that story, I, I have this woman who loves sex, loves to have sex with her husband, is like really, really into it. And their entire life, all he wants to do is untie her ribbon. Um, and at the end of the story, and, and no spoilers, because it's the same ending as the actual original story, is he, be- he begs her and harasses her and harangues her for their whole marriage. And finally one day she's like, all right, you want to untie it? Fine. And he does, and her head falls off. Um, and she dies. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, I am not a cheery mood. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not, it's not nice. And actually, you know, it's funny you would say that thing about consent because, as many of us know, who here read Cat Person over the weekend? That story in The New Yorker? Okay. So, so the reason I'm bringing this up is because that is also a story where the idea of consent, I think, has that sort of murkiness where, like, the, the protagonist of that story, you know, consents to sex, but in this sort of, there's this, like, larger sort of, air of like not being able to really say no even though she's like yes I will like there is consent technically but and I feel like many and I've definitely read uh, essays before by other writers about like that sort of like weird gray the gray area of like I'm technically consenting to this but also in an ideal situation I would be like I don't want to have sex with you and you go away right but like you're really anxious about like what will happen if you say that and so you do right so it's this very weird area that's like in in and I feel like that story really captured that element really perfectly um so yeah so I think and I think it's also relevant because I think not only should we talking about like 
it's not okay for your boss to like touch you. You know, it's not okay for someone with power over you to like sexually harass you. It's not okay to be obviously to be assaulted or raped, but also it's not okay for like it's for like men to have created this atmosphere where like women feel afraid to say no. And so they say yes technically, right? And I feel like that's like this whole other area of this conversation that like we're going to I mean, I think the re- I don't think oh god, everything I'm going to say is really depressing. Like I don't actually know if this movement I keep wondering, like, is this actually going to make a difference? Because it feels so powerful and so huge, but I feel like we have these... We, this happens every so often, right? It's like some group of people are like, fuck it, we're not going to take it anymore. And then there's, like, this big swell, and then it just kind of falls down again, and then everything kind of returns to normal. And, like, I'm worried that's what's going to happen with this. Um, but, I, but I do hope that, like, this sort of nuance, this element of, like, of, like, the larger sort of sexual culture, I think, is put under a microscope a little more and I mean it maybe hope maybe it'll make a difference I talk to college students around the country and one of the things that happens when we talk about sex in the classroom is that I always tell these young people I really feel sorry for you because this is a very strange time for sex between heterosexual people And I'll only speak to the heterosexual experience because it seems like popular culture says anything goes. But that's not true. (laughs) If you make a mistake, you could have your mistake be public on the internet forever. You can have legal consequences forever. And men are terrified, women are terrified, and yet we're told anything goes, and if you're not into everything, there's something wrong with you. This almost is kind of like judgment for women and men. And also, this is when young women and young men are adulting. And when we're just supposed to be interested in having sexual, sexual exploration, and then we introduce things like alcohol and drugs, which takes away the whole idea of consent, which really alters it. I'm a lawyer, so that's the reason why I'm even hypervigilant about this issue about consent. And then I kind of wonder, and then there's legal consequences. So you're encouraging women and men to drink as much as you want to, and then somebody is supposed to be more responsible, which I think, if you're really a feminist, you cannot accept the conditions of paternalism, because it's really paternalistic to think that men are always supposed to be watching out for you. Drunk young men, that's bananas. So (laughs) just think about it. You're saying like, you and I are gonna have the same number of shots and me maybe even more. I weigh less than you and I can't handle as much biologically speaking. So scientifically speaking and legally speaking, it offends me as a feminist. And it should offend all of us. And none of us should be embracing this idea of like, I should always be able to do whatever I want to. Because practically speaking, that's kind of dumb. So as a feminist, I sound like a grandmother right now, (laughs) and I don't care because I love y'all, and I want you to be safe. (laughs) I don't want you to go to jail. I don't want you to get raped. But all those things are going around right now. And as for all the Me Too, I think it is fantastic. I think it's fantastic. I think we should come out, and I I think we should talk about it. And I think we should talk about the complications of it. And as for the cat person story, I couldn't stand it. Oh, it bothered me so much, (laughs) and it bothered me, um, we don't have to talk about it here because not everybody has read it, but I think what she did was she did a very morally uh, tricky thing where she was in the wrong, and then because he uses the word whore, we're supposed to- argue about this later. Yeah. (laughs) Sidebar, sidebar. We're allowed to to hate him, and (laughs) and I found that to be really, um, I found that to be irresponsible as a feminist. So anyway, that's my stand on the Me Too movement. Yeah. Um, I, one of the things, and how do you pronounce your main character's name? Sunja or Sunja? Sunja. It's fine. Um, So one of the things I really thought about in reading her story was, um, you know, she's illiterate. She's, um, you know, a working in a inn in the beginning and um what does kind of consent and she's 15 i think right and um and what does kind of consent look like for that character and and what it really i felt reading it which is what i think is missing in the conversation is i think what you're getting at about how consent 
when we say consent is complicated, we don't mean like I said maybe and I meant yes. What, what, what it means is there are larger structural conditions that make it harder for certain women to say yes or say no or for anyone who is disenfranchised. And, and I felt that that character and, and kind of like her evolution into womanhood really got at that tension. I mean, did you think about that while you were writing? All the time. I think that if we have colonized minds, and all of us do in one way or the other, even when we think that we're really in control and self-actualized, we may be responding in a colonized way. And I yeah. think that if you're really honest, you have to talk about how much you're intellectually colonized and you have a post-colonial mindset. Mm -hmm. And consequently, sometimes our consent mm -hmm. is really blurry. And I, I, that's the reason why I think we have to be, all of us, if we want to have, if we want to continue to have sex with each other, and we may, if we want to procreate and create the next generation, <laughs> I think it's really important to think about these things as opposed to pretending like things are really binary because when it comes to sex, nothing is binary. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Morgan, in your, um, so you have uh, this chapter, A Hunger for Men's Eyes. Oh. So. <laughs> I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> the hardest essay I've yeah. ever read. Yeah, okay, well, well, we'll keep it light. We'll keep it, oh, so. No, that's so, <laughs> the, okay. well, the point, the thing that I actually really um, had never thought about before, and I would love for you to kind of expand on, is the contrast of the narrative of black women's sexuality and fast-tailed girls oh. versus the way that black women are actually raised to yeah. be afraid of sex and yeah. kind of where pleasure and like your journey of like finding pleasure through that. But can you expand on that a little? Yeah, just if you see me tearing up, I'm not crying. It's just because of the fan, okay? So just <laughs> FYI. My eyes have been really sensitive. Um, growing up, I have never heard of a black woman or black girl losing her virginity in a pleasurable way. It has always been described as like really traumatic. Um, and I think when I think about black girls sexuality, it's like we're, we're sexualized so young um, before we even know ourselves. You know, I think about, for example, um, the whole R. Kelly um, controversy, which has sort of been lost. And people are like, well, why is it that we aren't talking about it? It's because it's black girls and women and we as a society do not care about them. Because every time we have this conversation, whenever I'm having this conversation with someone who's black or with someone who's not black, it's like, well, what were these girls doing so-and-so? But you're not asking why this 50-year-old man praying at them to begin with. Um, I think when we talk about consent, um, when it comes to women, it's like, I, owe this man something. Like if he takes me out to Red Lobster and I get the lobster instead of popcorn shrimp, then that means that I should sleep with him because he spent the extra $20. Or like if he texts me right away or something like that, it's like I, he, he has to have something now. Um, and I think it gets even more stressful because Black women are always told that they're undesirable. Everything we do, we, we talk too much, we give too much of an opinion, we have natural hair and men like it long or everything. And how is it that we can even exist? And then when we get around a man, it's like we have to ha catch a man because all these statistics are like, you're unmarriageable. You're not gonna be able to find anyone for heterosexual women, for heterosexual women that wanna be uh, married. Let me just make sure I put that disclaimer there. So. It's just so, it's, it's really difficult because it's like, all right, so I look at myself as someone who's a single woman, single black woman, um, who wants to get married. And it's hard because pleasure for me has been a very, very, very jagged road. And I'm still getting there. Because when you're taught that anything you do it, you can be called fast-tailed, which means promiscuous, which really doesn't mean anything at all because if you talk to any auntie and ask them, what does a fast-tailed girl mean? They, they'll be like, oh, it's a slut, but it's like, oh, so because I have a skirt above my knees, that means I'm a slut now? And because we have this history of slavery where our bodies were not always our own, that makes it even worse. So it's like all of these layers on top of one another. And so that's the thing that's hard. So I was also raised in a black church as well. And so I wasn't taught about, like any of you who, who have studied the Bible or whatever, like, like Song, of, Song of Songs was really erotic. We, I never learned about that. I never learned about pleasure. There was never any talk about it. And 
I get it. I explained in my book, like, I think black women do this fast tail thing as, like, an ad- admonition to sort of safeguard you because they know that you can be dressed like me and someone can still call you a slut, you know what I mean? Especially as a black woman. But what it does is it doesn't give black girls, women a chance to explore themselves because you're already putting barriers on it. And then when, for example, you don't attract a man or you or something happens, then um, it's your fault. And I think it gets even more complicated when we have interracial conversations. So with the conversation of R. Kelly, when it's black men and black women talking, we have a responsibility as black women to protect black men. We are seen as the pillars of our society. So I remember when the whole Nate Parker thing happened and I wrote a piece for The Atlantic about the conversation of, of him uh, allegedly raping this woman and I wrote for it. I didn't say don't see the movie. I just said this is the conversation we're having. This is why it's hard because black men are like they're trying to tear this black man down, and black women are like, well, where does that put us? You know, for those of us who have been uh, victims of sexual assault, and I was called bed wench. I was called like, you know, all these nasty things that tie back to slavery, and it wasn't by white people. It was from black women that called me this. Because for somehow, for me just explaining what's going on in our community, I violated everybody just talking about it. So it's that chapter was hard for me to write because I felt like I'm, all, I'm not only putting myself into the story as a protagonist, but I'm also talking about things that, you know, have historically only been reserved in, like, kitchens and you know, in, in corners of just only black women. But I felt like I had to say something about it just so people can see how complicated it was and that there is no resolution to it because we're still trying to figure it out. My mother, for example, like after all this Harvey Weinstein thing has been happening, she's been thinking about encounters that she's been having and wondering, was that even really consensual? And it's really sad to see women in their 50s and 60s that sit down and are like, maybe I never really had a choice. You know, I never, I, I, I thought I was just doing what I was supposed to do and creating that atmosphere and it just like I guess that ties into my book like an undoing it's an unraveling of so many different things yeah and I I really um, there was one line that stuck out to me it was about how you know white feminists talk about consent and the limits of consent education to kind of grapple with this can you expand on that a little bit I mean mean, kind of just just, did but I mean it's hard because when I read you know, about consent and what it is, is not, it's usually from white women, white women who are dominating these pages. Um, and when it's, a, when black women are writing about it, it's more of like only in our circles. That's what it seems like for me. And obviously that might not be the case. Um, and I think it's just hard because it's like, how do we talk about consent from a person who, whose body has been subjugated for centuries while at the same time she's expected to be strong and withstand all pain while at the same time have to support everybody and have no room for herself. How do we even talk about yes, an enthusiastic yes, when we can't even say no either? So where is that, like, where, how do we like really tackle that gray area of expression without, as soon as a black person, a black woman's talking about it, it's like, well, all women do it. That's where it's like, no, like, let's stay here and focus on that a little bit. Like, how does consent look like through that sort of place from that particular woman? And how do we get to a place of what we call, like, liberation? Because even, like, even like sex positivity, I'm like, it's weird because when a lot of people talk about sex positivity, I'm like, I'm still trying to figure out what that means. Because it's, it's still saying, like, what does liberation mean when you've never been taught that? You've always been taught that you have to give, yep. you know? What does, what does receiving look like, you know? I feel like I was blab, like I was going off the tangent a bit. But no, yeah. <laughs> I, I would love to see that conver- I would love to see that conversation, yeah. though. Like, what does pleasure actually look like? What does liberation look like? Mm-hmm. Um, okay, uh, I have, how much we got? Like, five, okay. Um, I have two more questions and then we'll open it up to the audience Um, so the first is because I cannot you know it's in the description um, about how um, about feminism and 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 how feminism is impacting all of our work Um, the way that I think about it and I'm often jealous I always say that in my 40s I'm gonna write fiction um, because I everything is so realistic in the way that I write things and I so appreciate fiction's ability to create worlds and to explore themes that you know, nonfiction doesn't always have the language for or the ability to do. Um, 
what does it mean for you to be a feminist artist? I mean, do you identify as a feminist artist? And you know, how does it impact your work? Is it something you think about actively, or is it just something that you kind of embody and so you realize after that you're like, oh, that was pretty feminist character? I guess for me, um, for me, it feels just like uh, it's it's pretty in intentional. Um, I once had an editor look at a story of mine and observe. He was like, "There are just no male characters in here," <laughs> and I don't. Um, and I was like, "Well, yeah." So, and he was like, "Well, but like, there's a mother and a daughter. Like, you don't even mention the father." And I was like, "Well, I mean, it's not really relevant <laughs> to the story." Um, and I don't know, I feel like the thing that sort of kept me going is like this just desire to just barrel forward and fuck all and just do what I wanna be doing. Um, and like I, like I don't write f for men, and I didn't before and I sure as hell do not, <laughs> do not now. Um, and I think letting myself have that space and like letting myself like just push really hard into that space where I just do not give a fuck. Um, and how many times can I say I don't give a fuck? But I don't. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, just like letting myself, you know, and I feel like my work this year, like I have been writing a lot this year, but I've been, I mean, I feel like my work has gotten like darker and weirder. And I think I'm re responding to this like high level of like ambient anxiety that just like exists everywhere right now. Um, but yeah, so I think it's just important for me to just like, I feel like it was really easy to fall into that space where I was like, oh, I'm just a fiction writer. Like, what good do I do to any of this? You know, like, I'm not, like, I'm just, like, writing stories. Like, what, you know, like, is, is what I'm doing useful to the world? Um, but I feel like having to push past, like, pushing past that, that doubt and that anxiety and just letting myself, like, do what I need to do with my art, I think, is, is important to me. So. I think about it all the time. I think about it all the time because I'm an activist and I write fiction and my tool is radical empathy. If I could generate radical empathy with a person who does not agree with me, then it worked. So I don't feel like I have a specific audience. As a matter of fact, this book has really surprised me because it was on, believe it or not, the Goldman Sachs recommended reading list. <laughs> it was, no, no, there's more. <laughs> it was on the McKinsey Global Leaders reading list. I know. I was recently pretending to be a bookseller for the day for a friend of mine, and I was at the store, and this woman, she's sort of a high-powered university person, and she turned to her husband and said, I'm gonna buy this book, and I want my son to read it. I want our son to read it because he works for this like sort of global initiative for um, this nonprofit. And her husband turned to her, I'm not kidding, there were witnesses, and he said, you know, he's really busy, so he's got other things to read before he could read this. And then it was very funny because I actually turned around and I said, you know, it was on the reading list for McKinsey's <laughs> and Goldman Sachs. And then all of a sudden, like, he literally snapped to attention and goes, went, oh, maybe he should read it. <laughs> and then, of course, I'm thinking, and that day was the New York Times top 10 best. And I was like, I, I literally did like a mic drop because I was so pissed that someone can actually say that my work didn't matter. That said, <laughs> oh. The other thing, yeah. The Prime Minister of Scotland read this book. Yay! The introduction is written by the ambassador, uh, Caroline Kennedy, for Japan. I mention all this because I am so interested in making sure that everybody cares about the poor, the illiterate, women and men. I write a lot about gender and the understanding of gender for oppressed minority men. It is so important to me because if we are to have families and communities, we have to understand how to raise our sons and our brothers and protect our fathers and our husbands. And all this is really relevant to me personally. And through the lens of history, so many poor men and women have been fighting each other when we could be trying to make things better for ourselves. And the way I believe that fiction can generate radical empathy is by using the tools of an old Greek white guy named Aristotle. 
who is really smart, and he says in poetics, <laughs> and he says in poetics that the character must achieve recognition. The character must achieve reversal, and then the viewer or the reader can achieve catharsis. If I can get you to get catharsis by me doing my job with recognition and reversal, then we can get radical empathy. But I know that we're activists here, and I know that we're really being sincere, and I know that for a fact, Carmen's work is very beautiful and readable by everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I don't sit down and say, like, I'm going to write a feminist uh, piece. It just comes naturally because every time, because I spend a lot of time on the Internet, um, <laughs> someone's always ignoring black women. And I'm like, well, I'm going to write about it and make some money. But I do care. Like, I do care. Like, I'm like, why do people keep ignoring us? Um, and I think even when I was writing my book, before we had a subtitle and all that, I was just like, I want to write about black women be because why not? There's just so much to say. Um, and unlike you, Carmen, like I, th there have been moments, I will admit, where I will write something and I'll be like, oh, I'm going after the men again. I am not going to be able to get a date for I don't know how long. <laughs> because my mom because my mom would be like, oh, my God. My mom calls me a firecracker. She's like, why? She's like, why are you? Like, she, she loves that I am the way I am. But she's like, man, like, you're just on a roll. But uh, again, like, once you find success and once the direct deposit hits you, like, I don't give a damn what anybody <laughs> says. I'm doing a great job. So I, so, yeah, I think. I know that there's so much more I need to learn about feminism. So many things I have to unlearn. Um, and so I just love the conversations that are happening. And I try to make sure that even when I have a really staunch opinion about something, to try to dissect it a little bit more. And you might find some like messed up things from there. And luckily, I'm surrounded by um, women um, and non-binary friends who are there to help me and not just say, oh, I'm canceled, or I'm dragging you, or, you know, they'll, you know it's not self-righteous. So to have that warm community where they'll say, no, like, think about that a little bit more. And I'm really thankful for that. Um, so yeah, but I don't think the work is ever done. It's just like I'm trying to make sure people know that there are still parts of this, you know, people of this world that are still being ignored, and there shouldn't be any hidden figures. We should know about these people um, and what they're going through, and they don't always have to be tied to suffering either. Like you can find the extraordinary in the mundane or just in the joyous things, the pleasurable things. Yeah. And so that's what I'm, that's, that's like, I feel like what's going to be my life's work. Yeah. Great. Okay, last question. This is a quick one. Oh, Before we got to um, audience Q&A, I can tell people have so many questions. Um, how, uh, how do you reclaim your time? Can I not go first? Can someone else go first? <laughs> I'm gonna learn self-defense. Because, well, I reclaim my time by taking care of my body. This is the first year where I've like started to work out. But you know, after I saw Richard Spencer get punched, punched in the face, <laughs> I was like, that's what I'm talking about. I'm going to learn how to kick somebody's ass if and when I need to. And I urge all of you to do the same. So like anytime, so like I, like when people were like, oh, should we punch a Nazi? Hell yeah, you should punch a Nazi. Yeah, yeah, you should. And so I need to learn how to do that so I'm going to claim my time. And also just like I'm not going to answer certain questions that I don't feel like I need to answer. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time on the internet and like, you know, people, no, I remember one time I wrote a thing, well, Meghan Markle, um, you know, she got engaged to like a redhead. And um, <laughs> he, uh, so I was talking about how, you know, black women were happy because it's like, oh, okay, you have somebody who, you know, has African ancestries in the royal family. And this white man found me on Facebook, wrote to me and was like, oh, can you point me to any statistics that like show why black women are like, you know, th there's this like, this idea that they're like unmarriageable and desirable. I clicked on it, so he made sure I saw the, re he could see the read receipt, and I did not respond to that. <laughs> because I am not, I'm not gonna do that work. I'm not gonna say, you know, Google it, but at the same time, it's like, you, you know when somebody's about to just be a jerk. You know what I mean? So it's like learning, like, I can't do all of it for you. I am not, I can't be somebody's mule. 
Um, so learning how to defend myself physically and also know like, hey, I can't, I can't do this work all for you. And that's particular. And also how to log off too. Mm -hmm. Reclaiming your time is logging off. When I found out that, um, what's his name? Oh God. Um, Jeff Sessions, when he became attorney general, I literally just got out of Bible study, went right to the liquor store, and then I looked at it and I was like, I'm not looking at this anymore. I don't remember what happened after that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just was like, reclaiming your time can be, you know, knowing when to log off, to know when, you know, I can't protest, but here's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna donate, and don't let people force you into doing something when your body's not ready because the fight is going to be there when you get back. But we need you. So do what you have to do to revitalize yourself and then come help out. I love that. <laughs> I try really hard to say no more. I will say no thank you. So I, so I can be very flattered because somebody asks me something and a while ago I think I would have been like, okay, mm -hmm. no matter what, okay. And now I have learned more about saying no thank you. And then I also think the other thing that I do much more is I'm more honest about the things that I really believe in. So I talk a lot more about my faith. I talk about it all the time. Much t like so tomorrow I'm gonna do an, a conversation with the Atlantic Monthly and it's going to be about my favorite verse in the Bible, <laughs> in Genesis. And I will talk about things that are controversial because for most of my contemporaries, talking about religion makes them have a rash. <laughs> and that's okay. And I think just being able to be, like when someone says they don't find value in what I do, if I can't convince them, I don't have to agree with them. And I think that is one of the things that I've learned, is that if you devalue me, that is your choice, but I don't have to devalue myself by agreeing with you. And that can come in many different manifestations. So one of the things is, for example, is I have to learn how to negotiate for money more now, because some opportunities have come up, come up and I have to say, I don't agree with that price, so no thank you. And that's really new. That's very new. It's so new that things are falling off my chair. <laughs> my phone doesn't agree. <laughs> so those are the th things. Yeah. I mean, I think these are all amazing answers. I think valuing your time, absolutely. Like, say, you know, and also I recently realized I, I've been slowly acquiring no and nope themed clothing and accessories. <laughs> and I, I, was, I was, the other day I like realized I was wearing a hat that says nope, and then I had a shirt that was a Ouija board that had the sign say no. <laughs> And I was like, oh God, I have so many no things on my body. And I think it's like a subconsciously, I was just like, everyone leave me alone. Like, I don't want to be, no, don't talk to me. I'm very stressed out all the time. Um, and yeah, I think learning to say no and sort of asserting yourself, not engaging when you don't want to, um, you know, valuing your time, um, doing what you need to do to take care of yourself. I mean, these are all, I don't really have anything to add. Those are all amazing answers. Um, but yeah, you gotta you gotta find another day. Absolutely, like you absolutely yeah. have to like get to that get to that point. So don't burn yourself out. Um, yeah, someone said I think someone posted this on Facebook the other day. It was like, you know, instead of saying sorry for being late, thank someone for waiting. And I was like, that's oh, how that's I'm gonna beautiful. reclaim my time. <laughs> um, a round of applause, please, for this amazing. <laughs> Questions, and I think we have a mic, so. Yes, here. Hi, um, well first I just wanted to say thank you so much because this was really wonderful and interesting and you're all brilliant. Um, I have two quick things. First, um, weird to like open the session with this, but I just wanted to push back on something that you said <laughs> about consent. Um, when you were talking about meeting with college students and talking about how women wanting to get super drunk and then not be responsible for themselves was irresponsible. Um, having very recently been a college student myself, um, I think that what that analysis is missing is a little bit of, sorry, <laughs> is like um, a little bit of, like we were talking about how 
um, consent also exists in spaces of broader power. I didn't say it was irresponsible. I said it's not practical. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I think you were saying that we should be offended by it, right? Um, and I think that it's important to realize that consent exists in the context of uh, men holding these kinds of overarching power over women that we have not been able to shake, like you said, for the entirety of human history, um, and that we're struggling very, very hard against right now and coming up against just how, um, how foundational they are to the society we live in. And so I think that to say that um, women shouldn't be able to, whether or not they're drunk, whether or not they're doing whatever they're doing, that, that, that men don't in some way hold a responsibility for not raping us is, is wrong. Um, oh, no, I didn't say that. I'm sorry. If, I'm, if, I, if I gave that impression, I apologize. I wasn't saying that. I, I, didn't, I did not in any way intend to say what you said. What I was saying was that I felt sorry for people in this generation because if you introduce alcohol and two people drink exactly the same amount, but then one person is held liable to be paternalistic and take care of the female because of the superstructure of patriarchy. I think what happens, practically speaking, is that you're making every man somehow become the man. And that is clearly not true. Not every man is the man. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I just think that... Um I think that it's not a question of them being paternalistically responsible for women, but rather responsible for themselves. But anyway, just, um, but it was an interesting thing. And then also a question for everyone. I was kind of wondering, so like you, um, Carmen, I have been having an incredibly despairing year. Um, like you said, just sort of anxiety everywhere. Reading the news is horrifying. Um, I'm just wondering if you guys could all talk about a little bit sort of what you what you've done as artists and just as people and as women to get through like the daily aggravation and humiliation and degradation of it all. Um, if you, yeah, just what, what you've done. Thank you. Um, I'm a freelancer, so I have to deal with people like every <laughs> single day. So that's, that's what's good. I work out. Um, that helps to uh, sort of get rid of the stress. But also I do like really goofy things online. Like if I, um, if I read something horrible that he who shall not be named says, then I might just go on YouTube and I'll watch like a video of like dogs discovering snow or <laughs> like I'll watch like vine threads that people keep posting. Cause you have to like balance it out. So that usually helps. Or I'll just like, I'll send a DM or a G, a G chat to someone. It's like, hey, how are you doing? Um, it's just things like that, just connecting with people. Um, I have I took vacations this year. I was like, I got to get out of here. So I like fled the country twice, um, which was fun. But I also, but I think just in, in smaller ways, like just making sure that you're checking in with people, um, trying to like move around if you can, because I'm always in bed writing. So just moving for me helps. Um, and just finding goofy stuff, whatever you can find that's just goofy and nonsensical that can make you laugh. Uh, oh, do you? Yeah, I think that it's really important to recognize that you can feel depressed and to despair. And I think there's, it's really important to take the moment to lament. I think it's very, very important and to feel a sense of grief. However, I really encourage you to take action against the very thing that hurts you. I really encourage you to do something directly against the thing that's upsetting you. Because that is the only way that I feel like your generation will win. And I really am rooting for your generation. And I'm so concerned that my generation has failed your generation by not taking enough action and I think about that all the time because I'm a parent and I have a son who's 19, who's, he'll be 20. And when I meet the kids in college and when I go to speaking at universities, I think how can I support the next generation to feel really strong and yet recognize that they have every right to feel disgusted at what's going on? Because whatever you're seeing right now, every single day, there are things that are vile and that should offend your sense of meritocracy and yet we cannot we cannot give up. And in history, there have been far worse presidents. I know it's hard to understand that, but like Andrew Jackson was a son of a bitch. <laughs> you know, FDR even. 
like did terrible things, and he was considered a great president. George Washington did horrible things against slavery. Like, there's so many things that we have to recognize in terms of the long view. <laughs> While I try to break down the symbols of establishment. <laughs> But I want us to break down the institutions which hurt the next generation. And I feel very strongly that my generation and your generation have to work in partnership, not against each other, to make sure that things are not just better for me, but especially better for you. you. So I'm a teacher. So not only do I have to like be present for my, and and it, like I'm married, be present for myself, present for my, my partner, but also I have to go into a classroom and talk to students, and that's really hard when you feel like shit every day because the news is so unbearable. Um, and it, it, it worries me because I, I, it's like, you know, it's that, that energy, like having to be present for them and like, you know, being, being what I'm doing, what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, I think the idea of finding a thing to do to fight against it is really important. Um, I think that, I'm gonna use a phrase that I think is very fraught, but I'm gonna back, so self-care, but in the sense that self-care is actually a lot of hard work. Like people say, oh, self-care, it's like going to get a manicure, and like, no, 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 like self-care is like going to therapy, making that call, being like, I need to go see a therapist to talk someday every week, and like, I gotta like go through that. I gotta make a doctor's appointment to like deal with this thing. Like I need to make myself like, go to the gym or, or do like whatever I need to do to like get that energy out. Like there's actually a lot of hard work involved in that and actually like asserting that, that space for yourself. Um, and that's been a real lesson this year is um, you have to really uh, fight for that. Um, so yeah, I think this sort of balance of like striking out against, I love this idea of striking out against the thing that is hurting you and also like doing the work of taking care of yourself and the people you love. Um, and I, I think, yeah, that's kind of what's, that's what's kept me going. Therapy is great. I love it. I recommend it to anyone. It's really, I literally go in and yell about, I mean, like, I, you know, the whole election cycle, my therapist, it was like, I mean, I was like, is everyone in here yelling about the election? He was like, yeah, I'm like, more, I mean, like, that's like, it's obviously a common theme, right? Um, yeah, and like, actually, like, letting that, giving that space to myself to just, like, yell at somebody who's, like, not judging me. Not judging me, not yell at them, but like yell in the presence of them um, and just letting that kind of work all that work itself out. So, but yeah, doing the work. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here and, and sharing all this with us. Um, I'm really glad that you brought up the long view. I feel like a phrase that I've heard floating around a lot recently is now more than ever whether it's in the context of you know, human rights work or organizing or literature. And I think that there's a value to this sense of urgency of the work that people are doing, which is very important, but there's also a way in which it kind of erases the experiences and the voices of, of plenty of communities and populations that have been doing this work for a very long time and now is not necessarily more than ever. And I'm just curious um, what your take is on that, what you think are the stories that are most important right now and how to tell those stories in a way that's respectful and acknowledging you know, what's led up to that. If that makes sense. I mean, I think this idea of like a, like we're right, we're really aware of it right now, but also remembering that it has been happening. Like power structures have existed since, again, all of human history, and I think acknowledge they will continue to exist. Like we're not going to resist so hard that this entire thing breaks down into and, and everything is perfect. Like it's it's literally that it can't happen. And like knowing that this is like a long fight, and it has been a long fight. I mean, I think just like I, I love that idea of like acknowledging the work that communities have been like organizing for like a long time, like not just right now. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I think just like giving, like al allowing for the fact that like, it feels urgent right now, but like, it's sort of like, you know how like when there's a tragedy and like blood banks get like inundated with people who come in, they want to donate blood, but they're like, no, 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 we need blood like all year round. Like we have too much blood now, but we won't continue to need blood <laughs> as long as people have blood in their bodies. Like, so please come back in like a month or like two months or whatever. Um, and in the same way, like knowing that we have to like sort of spread that out. 
um, yeah, I think that's I think that's really important. I hate that phrase, like now more than ever. Like, no, because you know what that says? That says that all of a sudden it's just a shocker. Like, oh, how did we get here? You know how we got here. <laughs> like, when I saw those statistics of who voted for Trump and who didn't, like, that's not a surprise. So that's the part that bothered, that sort of paralyzed me in the beginning with the whole resistance movement was the now more than ever, we can't believe this happened. How did this happen? Like, if you were paying attention, like, you would, I mean, yeah, it was a shocker that she lost, that Hillary lost, but if you would pay attention to the people that are supporting them, they say, why they're supporting them? Like, if you pay attention to what's going on in Alabama right now, you know, it's like, well, how could we be surprised by any of it? So, um, it's hard, I think, I think it's hard for any of us to try to say which thing is more important because we all have identities that lay at the cross of like other intersections. So like, yeah, like I, I care about um, women's reproductive health, but I also care about, you know, ice raids. Um, I also care about, um, you know, when, when uh, Trump said like, you know, transgender people can be in the military even though they just overturned that. But I'm like, I, I care about all of these things. I think what is, what is our responsibility, and I think that ties into self care, is, to make sure that we can think about all of these things, that when we think about women's reproductive health, reproductive health, it doesn't just tie to white women or those who are not poor or not illiterate, right? And how does that lay, and how does that affect them trying to get birth control or trying to get abortion or just trying to get like, you know, like, like an exam? Um, so I think that's the thing. It's like now we're at a point, I think, where we just have to juggle so much um, at once and also take care of ourselves in the midst of it. So I think that, that I think is the challenge. But I think there's always something to be done. It's a matter of like, what can I do today? Okay, I didn't get to donate to the Trevor Project, but I can do that tomorrow. But I can, I can like text my senators and say, please save net neutrality. So I'm gonna do that today. And I think it's all a matter of doing that because you only have 24 <coughs> hours. So figure out what you can do each day. Also, I love your question, and it's a really important question, because instead of just recognizing that things can be terrible, also you can draw enormous strength from the strategies of prior work. So many people have been fighting injustice and inequity for such a long time. And also, when you, when you think you're fighting for you, very often you're fighting for other people, even unconsciously. The advances of civil rights for women have often been at the back of civil rights for African Americans. So when African Americans are fighting for civil rights, Asian Americans benefited without them necessarily intending so. And I think what we can do is try to find a kind of solidarity, but also a sense of perspective. And that's really hard sometimes when you see something so incredibly horrific <laughs> happening in front of your eyes. You're going, oh my God, that's so terrible. How could this happen? But the reason why you're so surprised very often is because we don't know how many other incredibly horrible things have happened. But in light of history, and in light of the very painful history in America, I mean, there's been federal legislation against the Chinese in this country that wasn't overturned till 1945 to exclude them. And this happened twice and it was amended to be extended for several decades. So when you think about the Muslim ban, which is incredibly offensive, you have to say, this is connected to the Chinese Exclusion Act. And when you know about that, you have to think, well, what are the strategies that will work in order to get rid of the Muslim ban? Perhaps other people have been solving this problem before. So yes, I definitely feel your sense of despair and irritation and shock and horror. However, you're not alone and we're not the first generation. Okay, one more question. Uh, I want to thank you all. It's, um, it, I want to thank you all, uh, and I'm sure I speak for, for everyone else. Um, I just finished your book. Oh, thank you. I think. And for the first time <laughs> in decades that, that I can recall, um, in fact, I'm not even sure when this if ever, has ever happened. I went through the first part and I loved it and then three quarters in I'm going, ah, what's happening? And I cried on the last page. My question. <laughs> 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 uh, 
She hasn't said if she likes it yet. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I thought she was about to spoil the ending or something. <laughs> if I've gotten my older Republican sister whose Thanksgiving I haven't gone to for two years in a row after going for 30 years to start reading your book and liking it, I would say I think it's one of the best books I've ever read. So thank you. So thank what's you. the difference between empathy and radical empathy? I think radical empathy is when you can actually reach your enemy. If you can respond to hate with love, if you can respond to hate with active change, not just for yourself but for others, if you can sacrifice your ego for the greater good, that's radical empathy. And I believe that all of us do it all the time. I think we do it all the time, especially with those we love. Like if you're a parent, you're doing it all the time. <laughs> like I eat humble pie every day. <laughs> Why? Because I love him so much. And I would do, I would look stupid and I would say I'm sorry if it meant that Sam would do better. And I feel this way about this country. I wasn't born here. I came when I was seven and a half. And I can't tell you how many people have extended radical empathy to me, to see me as an American even before I became an American. If I didn't have the support of Everybody in New York and Queens and in the Bronx and in Manhattan giving me shelter, education, books, encouragement, I wouldn't be sitting at the Strand with these smart women here. And I think that because I've had radical empathy extended to me, I've worked very hard as an artist to understand how do I do that in a book? Because a book is a very slow media, but it is a really life-changing media. Because books have changed my life. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today.